Good morning. Um, I'm coming from very much the other end of the scale than um, the dairy industry and uh, coming from the smaller manufacturer in New Zealand. Um, I, my presentation is going to be in two snapshots. One, a little uh, look at smaller food manufacturer and then look at a couple of things that we're doing within our um, type of manufacturing and I think it applies across to a lot of different New Zealand manufacturers and especially into the smaller timber. Um, just as a sideline by the way, if you enjoyed the lamingtons this morning, that's us. The um, little bit of background, Baker Boys is a privately owned 30-year-old uh, business in Christchurch, around 160 odd staff. We actually rate as a major uh, employer in Eastern Christchurch. We are a private label manufacturer, so 95% of our products we don't is doesn't have our brand on it. And while uh, you may not know our brand, I guarantee you've eaten it, um, and I guarantee you've come across it at various times. One of the things that's a similarity um, between our business and the timber that you guys are involved with is um, we also. In, uh, exist in an environment where there's a very, very big player and then the rest of us. Timber industry, there's the very, very big player of exporting logs. We see the scale from the earlier presenters and then there's the rest of all of you gentlemen trying to add on to that as a value add. Food export, there's the huge player that everybody knows in New Zealand which is the dairy export and then there's everything else that's trying to tickle alongside. So this is one of the statements I make um, which is in food manufacturing, New Zealand, we don't export a product, we export a vision. Um, so the classic, it's a black and white cow standing in a green field under a nice mountain with some um, blue skies above it. We export trust in food, and certainly into Asia, that is by far the absolute killer. Um, to give you an example where we looked at recently in Baker Boys with an export opportunity, and uh, I had to sit with my export team and describe They'd been asked about exporting biscuits, which we make, into um, China. And to give you an idea of scale, we have our main biscuit line produces around 16,000 biscuits per hour, 24 hours a day, six days a week. It's quite impressive to just see this never-ending stream of biscuits coming off. However, if we exported um, biscuits and we were selling to 1% of the Chinese population, and to that 1% we sold one biscuit, not one packet, one biscuit, once a week. At our plant at its maximum production doing nothing else took 18 months to supply that need. Guess what, we're not doing it. It's, it's never going to happen. Um, going into our world, our big driver in our world is much like the milk, is compliance. Our compliance regime is growing. Um, it's being chased more and more and people are looking for food security and that relates back to the trust of food. So our challenges are much like you guys' challenges. We're a manufacturer. Um, our uh, rising HR costs. We have a very large number of what I describe as visa interesting staff. We give a lot of staff and uh, people in Eastern Christchurch and across Christchurch their first jobs when they come in as new immigrants. So we got basic processing manufacturing. So we have a lot of people down at the minimum and low low wage level. The changes that kicked in on Monday, that's been a massive impact to us. And it's not only an impact to us, it's an impact to our industry. All the way through, if you have from the raw material producers, if it's a fruit pick or something like that, they're paying near minimum wage. We're doing basic, basic processing. We've got a lot of people at near minimum wage. You get out to your supermarkets, huge number of their staff are the um, your kids, your university students, or your mums working part-time who are stocking shelves, they're all at minimum wage. Minimum wage change, that impacts us all the way across the industry. Same with any other sort of compliance, um, domestic violence leave, that's another big impact that's just had with us. And then, like, much like everybody else, trying to get good staff. Um, there's a huge shortage out there. The discussion about trends earlier on, we find in our world Trends are crazy. The impact is uh, never ending. Um, yes, the example uh, spoken by the earlier speaker about cha butter changing from being the bad thing 10 years ago to now everybody else wants butter. Um, everybody likes butter fat. Butter prices go up. Um, we use a lot of butter. We buy it by the ton. Um, it costs a lot. 
you won't get other trends with things like um, hemp is very, very trendy at the moment. Everybody wants to put hemp seed into a product. Is it good for you or not? That's not for me to ask, but we're getting customers who are saying, can you add hemp? We don't know. We've got to work on it. And we've got teams trying to make recipes. Um, one of the other trends that's uh, just an interesting example, one of our major offshore clients had a corporate decision that they were going to have a 10% sugar reduction. Now, one of the products, main products we supply them is caramel slice. <laughs> <laughs> you go to them and say, so would you like it a bit smaller? Because that's what 10% reduction. Um, they said, no, no, we'd like a 10% reduction. Um, that was a challenge. Uh, we also went through a scenario where a major customer wanted a 10% salt reduction in sausage rolls. So we made them a sausage roll with 10% less salt. And we took it to the test team and they went, oh, this tastes like crap. You go, well, <laughs> that's what you wanted. So these things add for challenge in our world. One of the interesting things we have is um, border controls. For us, border control, uh, you have the recent thing with the mosquito in Auckland, as an example, type of border control. These things impact what New Zealand's clean green image is. We're selling clean green image. If those things uh, get too much, they're seen in the international markets, our position degrades. It, it adds to an extra challenge for us. Um, ethical traceability. Uh, we've just been through accreditation for what's called European CDEX um, accreditation. Now that's an ethical sourcing. It had a whole series of questions. One of the ones that we found interesting was, did we have a, or what was our policy on employing 12 year olds? Our answer was, we don't have a policy. Cross, bad people. You know, because this was a European standard that was based on employ um, bringing products out of Africa, their assumption that we didn't have a policy meant we were a bad people, not that we didn't employ 12-year-olds. That cost a lot of money to bring a expert out from UK to do a actual reassessment on us so we could maintain our accreditation. Just little communication difficulties. Green packaging is a beauty for us. We have the Australian government has decided that by 2025, um, all packaging will be recyclable um, in some format. Currently, there is almost no packaging is actually recyclable. Um, and I say that in a very broad brush statement. Um, there's, you get into combustible, um, uh, recyclable, there's all sorts of theories, there's lots and lots of theories and it's, it's a great thing. Um, however, nobody's actually delivered it yet. So we now have a fixed time limit. Our customers are coming to us saying, we want you to be there. We can't get there yet. <laughs> Jumping across. Talking about future manu uh, manufacturing theory, as I say here, New Zealand, we're a country of do-it-ourselves and we're largely being small operators and you look at the internationals, the big corporates, and we largely sit at the bottom end of the scale. That's where our world is. And traditionally, we've done things that we're very proud of, the great New Zealand number eight wire mentality. Um, and the other thing is throw people at a problem. Um, certainly, if you wanted to grow your business, you just threw more people at it. And that just doesn't work involve, uh, into the future. You then look at where we're competing, and we compete with some very big international players, and you get they have huge resource to throw at these things, and we really don't. Um, the anecdotes I've seen before, SAP. Um, you throw SAP into a business, there's a few million gone. Well, we don't have a few million to play with in this sort of market. Um, you want to buy a robot, um, robots are really expensive. They're, um, they're great, but what a huge cost. So traditionally, New Zealand survived on more people making do and working it out on a piece of paper. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to survive into the future if we keep doing that. So the other part of my presentation is a discussion about a smart enough factory. Um, you hear a lot of things on the slots consultants will tell you about a smart factory and what they can do and everything. And they're great. Guess what? Generally, we can't afford it. Um, so we've got to work out how to do it in a Kiwi way. Some of the things is you've got to be able to look at what you're doing, what your suppliers are doing, how do you gain the information, how you can squeeze every little piece out of that, how you can use automation to reduce your costs but not over the top. 
um, how do you use big data, which is a great thing. And big data in my terms in manufacturing is if I have a sensor that's piecing, running on a piece of machinery, I want it to be telling me what is happening every second, not what is happening every 25 minutes. Those seconds of data just absolutely grow exponentially. Um, and I don't want to own a server farm to try and collect that. That's just too expensive. The other things that are coming in is smart devices. We, we all have one of these things. You know, How do you use these consumer electronics rather than industrial electronics into the world? So within our food industry, this gets rather techy, but you're looking at the, the key three areas and where do you get a connection where they all bring come together and where can you do um, all of these pieces and put them into an economically viable centre so we can uh, work through our plant aut automation, grab our stock details, grab our production details, then introduce the various compliance we've got with audits, recalls, um, traceability. It adds a uh, big challenge. So the, one of the big differences to go and from a smart, smart enough point of view is don't go looking for the really big picture. Don't, don't try and change your whole system into a, over to a monstrous. Go looking around the edges. Go looking for the, the bits that you can get. You can nowadays, systems can be gained that are in the thousands of dollars, not the millions of dollars. The other thing is try and integrate as much as you can into a single system. Um, we've been going through this process we're almost two years into a process of getting to the point where all of our databases across the company, sales, financial, warehousing, distribution, manufacturing, auditing and compliance is all feeding into one place of database. So we're not double handling, we're not chasing all the time. It's, as I said, it's taken 18 months, two years to get down the track and for us it's taken around a quarter of a million dollars to do it but that was a variation on doing it when consultants offered it to us for millions. One of the things is linking in with your supply chain. Um, more and more for us is authenticity and uh, traceability and compliance. In our world of traceability and linking all the way through, we comply as Baker Boys complies with the UK BRC standard to match our exporting requirements. BRC requires that if you have, you're standing in a supermarket and you open a packet of biscuits or something and there's a problem with it, you report it to the supermarket, the report, supermarket reports it to us. We then, as the manufacturer, have to be able to identify every single product from every single batch, from every single supplier that went into that product. We have to do that within two hours. We also have to be able to say where every single one of those products then went and who we sold it to. And if you start thinking about the orders of magnitude in that, it just gets really scary. We also have to take the other extreme, where is if one supplier who might be on the other side of the world calls us up and says, hey, we actually sent you a batch of something and it's got a problem. Once again, within that two hour window, we have to be able to identify everywhere we use that raw material, in every batch, how we packaged it, who we sold it to, which customer it went to, and where it ended up. You need data, and data is to be able to challenge this. Um, Baker Boys survived on a system that was paper-based, and we needed every second of that two hours when we were audited. And we're audited on this process about four times a year, and we needed every second. We're now going into a digital, and by keeping everything as a single, single source of the truth, we can pull that down to minutes. The other thing is uh, EDI, and uh, those of you who supply finished products out to the big timber merchants, you guys will start knowing what I'm talking about with EDI, um, which is you receive an electronic order, you, there's nobody at the end of the phone saying, I'd like to buy so-and-so. There's a computer sending out an order, coming into your computer set and system and generating a sales order and sending it all the way back. This is becoming more and more, this is the, world, the way the world's going. Internationally, it's going like this. And while it was the preserve of the very big companies, it's, it's hitting us and it's heading throughout industry everywhere. So it's something to be planning for and working on. Automation. Um, Unfortunately, 
capital expenditure, I think somebody was alluding earlier, is you're going to have to spend it. Um, we're a, even though we have low wages, we're a high wage economy. Um, we're struggling. I have lots of projects underway. Um, with my company, I've got three robotics companies working on projects right now, two in New Zealand, one on Australia, on ways of taking um, automating products. One of the fundamental rules we have in the company is um, if you pick up something and put it down repetitively, we're looking for a machine to replace it. All the staff know that. The other mantra is we want a uh, I want to employ you for what's between your ears and not what's between your shoulder blades. I do all the standard health and safety monitoring, as I'm sure all of you guys do. 90% of my health and safety and my ACC costs are from stress and strain injuries. People picking things up, putting them down. Um, it's just an ongoing cost. We've got to kill it and get rid of it. Big data is a subject that comes along and is growing. Um, and it's all of how you do this. Uh, interestingly, I threw this slide in simply because there's been a massive change in the last literal weeks. Um, we've been working with a supplier where a big data historian type system, which traditionally came out of the oil and gas industry, and those guys were saying millions of dollars for a system. There wasn't any, you know, they were used to dealing with the oil and gas boys. They've got lots of money to play with. They started looking at going into other industries and they were looking at pulling that from millions to possibly hundreds of thousands to now being maybe tens of thousands for storing your data. Um, Microsoft literally a few weeks ago announced that said, this is where they plan to make all, Bill Gates wants to make a whole lot more money into the future, so he's going to get into this game. So you're now talking big data storage systems online at the tune of under a thousand dollars a month that instantly becomes viable for us and it's also puts data into an area you can squirt data up to it and then you can pull it back out and actually start understanding what your machines are doing when things switch on switch off what are your costs how do you integrate all your labor costs to it the other thing is um, use of smart devices we're getting a lot into this really fast one of the things is you have people who are noting things down, they're writing, you know, doing the traditional writing down, taking measurements, that sort of thing. Devices have very recently started getting lots, lots smarter and lots, lots cheaper and easier. Um, I'll just jump across. This is a idea where you're talking about using consumer devices. You know, 10 years ago in industry, if you wanted to have a VR type, virtual reality type device, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars. Now you're talking about a few hundred dollars in an um, iPad or a knockoff of an iPad, which are common. Um, and the software out there that does it really fast and easy and does for your um, maintenance and running costs. The world's changing really fast. Inline devices, smart, um, smart scanning. Where they used to do, we're putting devices in right now where Two, three years ago, you'd get a scanning device that would scan a barcode. Now it'll scan the whole label. So it'll, it's not only looking at machine-readable type data or a barcode, it's actually reading the stuff that human beings normally are standing there to read. So you can have now machines making a lot of the decisions and the staff you have are using that information, not gathering that information. And that's where we've got to go. This is an example where a scanning and what it's done is it's scanned and looked for date codes, it's looked for the correct label, it's collect orientation of the label, um, all that information instead of just a few years ago it just would have looked at a barcode. Robots. Um, I did a project in the States in the early 2000s and it cost 250,000 US per robot and geez, another 50,000 in programming. <laughs> Go in, you now look at a robot, 35k, collab robot, don't need it to be guarded, work around um, your staff, program it yourself. This is just a reactor. This came out of um, Monday. This was the Australian um, Financial Review. And what it is is a series of numbers on how fast they expect jobs to disappear due to automation. And my statement at the bottom is we need to match or exceed this because the Aussies are our direct competitors. And just a final statement. 20% reduction in labour force is expected in food production at the same time as expected to double. 
Um, you think about that with your employees and that sort of thing flows on. Sorry.